Penelope Keith needs no introduction. We talked in a very noisy restaurant, and I began by asking her about her earliest memories of the theatre. My family initially were from Clapham and Balham's. I was living at my grandmother's with my mother. And she took me, I went to see Cinderella, Streatham Hill, when I was two, apparently. And the moment the Ugly Sisters came on, I said, I don't like those nasty men. <laughs> And that was it. And I never did like clowns, because I, I couldn't bear people getting hurt, and they were always hurt. But I remember, well, I don't remember it, but I, I, I do know that was my very first thing. But of course, the thing is, my mother, who was a working mother, divorcee, um, took me to the theatre every um, holiday, because that was my treat. So I saw things like The King and I, I saw, did I, I don't know if I saw South Pacific. I saw South Pacific. I this was locally around South no, London? No, 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 in, in London. I was always taken up to London. The first play I ever saw was one called The Young Elizabeth, with Mary Morris. Oh, yeah. And it was lovely, because I worked with Mary in a television series. And when someone asked me about, you know, going to the theatre, and I said yes, I think I was seven or eight. I was very young when I saw it, and it was, I can remember it, it was uh, The Cry, and Mary Morris. I can remember seeing separate tables when I was young. These were all the original productions, I oh, think. Yes, yes. yes. Mm. Because Mummy took me to the theatre. I remember seeing Call Me Madam, Damn Yankees, The Coliseum, all those big musicals. Of course, I, I then went on when I was at drama school to go and see everything. But those were the early plays. It, at that point, did you decide that that's what you wanted to do? Oh, I, I wanted to do that from the time I was five. That was it. And did you do any? Did you do school productions? Oh, yes, anything? school plays, yeah. Yeah, and Brighton festivals. Because I was at school in Seaford. Oh, that morning right. school. So I did Brighton festivals, things like that. What did you do? What parts were you playing it? Well, in the Brighton Festival, it was verse speaking, and I did. We had to do the sonnet to Crabbed Age and Youth Cannot Live Together, the Shakespeare. Youth is full of pleasant, age is full of care. Remember it? Uh, I think I won that. I can't remember you, so I think I did. And my what, school, what age was this? I must have been about 12, 11 or 12. And my school won the school verse speaking one as well. Because was, it was a convent school, but they had an emphasis on drama. They, they, they did elocution and then yes, from that they did speaking competitions, yeah, poetry, that's whatever. Right. That's right, and it wasn't about speaking poetry, no. it was about speaking so other yeah, people yeah. could understand you and hear you. And understanding the me mechanics of speaking. Exactly. We, I think everybody had elocution lessons. Yeah. I think I just missed that. I think people, I, I think I possibly knew a few people that did, but I think that had passed. It was very much a sort of 40s and early 50s yes, thing. Yes, it was. And as I say, I'm not talking about accents at all. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Do you know what I mean? It's the mm. actual timbre. And I'm sure... Which is a bit of a prerequisite, actually. <laughs> well, I would have thought so, because you do actually want an audience to want to listen yeah. to the sound. Absolutely. Like someone playing a violin well. I was talking to uh, Ben Whitrow last week. He worked at the, um, the Bristol, and when O'Toole came back and did a season there when they were trying to raise cash, and everybody was just standing there watching yes. him and learning. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I, I did exactly the same. Yes, exactly. I, was, I never spent it when I was there, never spent any time dressing. I was always in the wings exactly. watching. No, no, you never get that. It's interesting, I was thinking that the other day when Max Bygraves died, I remember doing a gala. Oh, back in there. Oh, 60s for Michael Robbins, who I'd been in rep with his wife, Hal. Dyer. They lived in Wimbledon and I did a gala. And they managed to get Max Bygraves. It must have been 60, God knows what, one or two. And, I, and, and my grandmother adored Max Bygraves. I, so I, of course, course. I, of course, didn't think much of no, Max no. Bygraves because, you know, no. all that. I remember standing in the wings and watching as he walked on, and I'd never seen anything like it. I was just amazed. Within 30 yeah, like seconds. That. Absolutely. It was, he had them there. Absolutely. It was quite extraordinary. And funny enough, they all spoke about it during his obituaries. You could only learn that by going on twice nightly in Absolutely. Glasgow or something. And I, I, I can remember thinking I, who'd been 
quite sort of, I was, you know, early 20s, an actress. And just looking at it, this is quite fantastic. You know, you should bottle it and sell it. Of course you can't. But one learns so much. You learn so much about being in the One of the themes in my book is working with comedians or non-actors, which I think you've done quite a lot of. A lot. And They're Joe, my heroes. And, and Joe Jusen had as well. They're my heroes. I always say, I always say to young actors, I say, you know, I, 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 I knew Frankie Howard a bit. I worked with Malcolm and Wise, and I saw Les occasionally, and I said, they reach peaks that we couldn't even think of, mm. because they aren't. They go out there totally naked, mm. and they, within three minutes, they've got them, and if they haven't. But it, which is fine, but if you have to work with them in a straight thing, then it becomes a problem, does oh, it yes, not? Yes, yes. Because I mean, you're coming from completely different places. Yes, yes. I mean, I haven't done as much as Joe did. Mm. Joe did a lot. I had my one, you know, 15 minutes of fame with Eric and Ernie. We were lucky with The Good Life because it was one of the first situation comedies when all the actors had come from the same background, yeah. the four of us, we'd done our, you know, we'd done our training, we'd done our rep, and we'd done a bit of classic. Because I'm not funny. I'm only... You've made a, you've made a career out of being funny. Well, no, I've made a, I've been very lucky to play some of the great yeah, yeah. comedy roles. But I'm not funny myself. So, no, no, um... I would disagree with that. I think you are funny. And well, I think that's why... I've got some funny bones. I think I understand playing comedy now. It is timing, yes, and all that. But it's also being aware of the audience. Well, Michael, I remember to, uh, when I was doing Time in the Conways. They were all young, of course. But I remember talking to one of the young men who was sweet, lovely. And he'd done a bit of maybe two or three fringes, or hot fringe things, and he'd done two or three lines on television, and this was the first time he'd had a reasonable part in a, a tour. And I see, and he was 25. I said, you see, the difference is that when I was 25, I probably played 40 or 50 professional roles, 49 of which were probably bloody awful, but I'd actually stood mm. up on a stage in front of a paying audience and done it. When you went to, to drama school, how did that come about? When, when was it decided that you should go to drama school at that point? Well, I left school early because I took my O-levels early and there was no question of A-levels or university. No. I always wanted to act. And I was only, I was just 15, so um, I went to France for six months because I was too young. And then I started applying, so I went very young to drama school, to Weber D. I, that's what I always wanted to do. So there was no question of not. So, and uh, I went to Central, I applied there, and they told me I was too tall to be an actress. Vanessa had just left. <laughs> um, so I didn't get in there. And then Weber D was the other one I tried for, and I, so I was there for two years. What year was this? 58 ish? Uh, 57 to 59. 57, 58. Who was, who was there with you? Who was there? Uh, Sam, Samantha Egger was the year below me. Um, Terry Stamp, Rick Jones was there, mm. Marina. Burkoff was Burkoff. Oh, was Burkoff there? was there, yes. He and I entered the Carlton Hobbs things together. Stephen and I. What memories do you have of, of him? Did you work with him at all? Yes, but not a lot. They, were, they don't loom very large, really. Both did the Carlton Hobbs radio thing together. We were taught by lovely Ivan Sampson at drama school. And you had to stand an arm's length away from the microphone. I can remember it still. I can remember it vividly. This is what you had to do. Wonderful. When you left drama school, what was your first job? You Chesterfield. Remember? Weekly around six months at Chesterfield. I started in September. Civic Theatre. It was an old theatre. The Pomegranate, yes. The I Pomegranate. It was now called the Pomegranate. Why, don't you? I can't remember an thought about it. And then... Then Link. Link, then Link. Because you, you were there the season before, weren't you? Because you were there with Stephanie Cole. Yes, I was there with Steph. Um, Pam Miles, who I still see and hear from. Um, Do you remember those, going, those excursions we had in London? Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. And, and oh, we had this thing with you... Because uh, when I contacted you last year, cause I always remember you having an Austin A35, a pale blue. No, it wasn't. Blue. It wasn't an Austin. It was a Triumph. 
It was a standard, standard eight, little standard eight. But it looked a bit like a no, Yes, but it was a standard eight, double D clutch. And you were one of the very few people who had cars I in those know. days. I mean, nobody had cars. Nobody had cars at all. I think the only mothers. people I knew in those days who had cars, Jimmy Bolam had a car. Yes. Yes. And a couple would. of Stephen Hancock, do you remember Stephen yes. Hancock? He mm. had a car. And I think the three of you, the only That's people right. I know in those Absolutely. days. Absolutely. And there's think about four or five people in it. Yeah, double declutch. Oh, we went to see Gypsy in the ABC. That's right. That's Fulham right. Because this was the wonderful thing in our day. Were the stories. Absolutely. Do they still, I mean, no. do those stories still around? No. no, I think maybe... I mean, I remember it like the Rob Atkins story. Oh, <laughs> flower. You see, flowers are in his pierce. Yes, but you see, oh, who was it? We were talking about a story the other day, and no one knew who we were talking about. It was off. When I worked with A.J. Brown on Donkey's Years, he was fascinating. He'd been a pilot in the First World War. But he said when he joined the theatre as a young man, just after the First World War, when the older actors spoke of Irving, they'd either take their hats off or stand up. It's sir, it's the old um, exactly. dresser thing, sir. Exactly. But it's just so almost soul-destroying that the heritage of it Which is, is the important thing. And that's what I want to just get down on paper, because in ten years' time there won't be any, any no, people who've no, le left who've no, worked in that. No. No, no, they weren't. No, they Certainly, weren't. I mean, even the ones who worked in, in, in Weekly Rep, I mean, Weekly Rep fizzled out, I, mean, oh, yes. I suppose, the early yes. 60s. But yes. No, I mean, when, when, when I say to people and I worked in Weekly Rep, they are absolutely amazing. Or even twice nightly yes. Weekly Rep. Yes, no, I never did that. Johnny Normington did, but I never did.